Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Um, my name is Amy, Amy um, and I'm originally from the Derby in the East Midlands. Okay, well, um, I come from a very small family, um, and traditionally an English and Irish family, and um, my family are Christian, but we've never practiced the faith at all. Um, I learnt most about Christianity at school, um, and I always believed in God. Um, I just, I always thought it made sense that the world around me had a creator, and um, yeah, um, I found school life quite difficult. Um, I found dealing with the other kids and the teachers as well kind of gave me a really hard time for a few years. Um, but And it wasn't until I actually moved to high school that things started to improve. I was getting the support from my teachers and I'd started to make friends and felt more kind of comfortable within myself. And at this point, like I was more agnostic than anything else because I, um, of course I believed in God, but in my view from kind of my earlier childhood experiences, I didn't want to worship God because I just thought God wanted to punish us and make us suffer and make us sad. So I just, I, you know, I, I just didn't want anything to do with religion at all. and. Especially like when I started doing my GCSE in uh, religious studies, we um, primarily looked at Christianity and I found that I had so many problems with so many of the Christian doctrines and I just, in my heart, I just could not accept. Well, I never really came over those difficulties, really. I just struggled um, just interacting with the other students at my school and um, dealing with the pressure as well that was put upon us to succeed. Um, pretty much from the age of 11 onwards, everything became about exams. And kind of the way I felt about it was if I didn't pass this exam, then I was a failure. And um, every time I did well in a test, I would feel like I had some self-worth. I was. You know, I had no self-esteem as a young teenager. Um, I was very self-conscious and I, I was very anxious as well because um, I suffered a lot from bullying when I was very little and it really did impact me on how I was with other people. So I had enormous social anxiety and kind of over the years as well, like, I quickly developed depression and I was um, diagnosed with it when I was about 15 or 16 and um, it just got to a point where like I really just I didn't really want anything to do with life I didn't want to go to school I didn't want to do my exams I just I didn't have the time for it anymore I didn't see the point of it you know um well, from a young age at my primary school, we were taught about Christianity, but I was at an age where I just, I kind of just believed everything that my teacher told me, but kind of as, as I grew up and I started doing my GCSEs, that was the first time I was really looking at Christianity, like with a more kind of mature uh, and more kind of critical academic kind of eye. And the biggest problem I had was the issue of the Trinity. Like, it just did not make sense to me that God would almost kind of split himself up into three parts. And kind of from my point of view, like, if God is supposed to be just and because and if he wants people to succeed and go to heaven then the concept of god has to be easy to understand any human being no matter what age or for what country they're from what race you know whatever kind of education they have they need to understand that concept because if they don't understand the concept of god then surely they cannot succeed and you know i just think if you go out and ask any person on the street, I think most people wouldn't be able to explain the Trinity and they wouldn't be able to understand it. Let alone if you had like, just like a little eight year old kid and you were trying to explain it to it. So that was the biggest problem for me. And I think the issue about um, Jesus alayhi salam um, being the son of God, um, it just, he always struck me as a prophet and 
from the parts of the Bible that I had read, I only started reading the Bible when I was about 18, but before that, the bits that I had read, there was nothing that was convincing me that he was more than a man. He was doing things that normal men did. He was praying, he was eating, he was drinking. You know, he just seemed like a normal man who was trying to portray a message. And I found it very difficult that to see God in such a weak and, you know, just a weak human being. It didn't make sense to me at all. Um, well, when I was 17, I, um, I met my first boyfriend and um, he was actually a Sunni Muslim. He wasn't practicing though. And um, I was with him for two years. And when I was 18, he proposed to me and we planned on getting married when I had finished university. And um, he was um, the first kind of, the first introduction to Islam that I ever had um, and he said to me like would you ever consider being a Muslim because he wanted his wife to be a Muslim and he told me a few things and I thought oh, okay well I'll, I'll go and read about it I didn't know anything about Islam I'd heard about things like 9-11 on the news but to me that didn't make me kind of scared or didn't make me feel any kind of hatred towards Muslims. I didn't know enough to form an opinion. So I started to read and I was actually very pleasantly surprised at what I found. And I was actually really impressed with the simplicity of Islam and um, the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Ali. Um, so I turned to him and I said, yeah, well, I would be happy to become a Muslim. and. You know, I was doing it for completely the wrong reasons. I wasn't doing it to impress Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like I should have been doing. But kind of in my younger, more naive years, I was doing it to impress him, you know, because he was such a big and important part of my life. I just, you know, I just wanted to impress him. And um, so I just started to practice it um, very, very slowly. Um, but um, what hindered me um, was basically um, this relationship that I was in was a very volatile relationship. Um, he was quite abusive with me um, on various occasions. It was a really difficult time for me to deal with. And um, basically it just got to a point when the abuse was um, just getting too much. He, Basically, he just tried to hurt me in any way that a person could hurt you. And um, I had to leave that relationship and it broke me because that was it. That was my entire future gone. I'd planned a wedding. I'd planned a future with him and all that was gone. And I didn't know what to do now. And like, I just didn't have that strength to hold on to Islam. And... I tried, you know, part of me tried. I went, I tried to um, go to several different Sunni masjids in my area um, and actually found quite a lot of discrimination against me. Um, I'd go to the masjid, I'd go into the sister's section, I'd be, you know, modestly dressed, or wouldn't be doing anything wrong. But like the looks and the whispers that I would get from the men at these masjids, just made me feel so uncomfortable. And like, I just didn't like being there and I just couldn't wait to get out. And I didn't know why. I didn't know if it was because I was English. I didn't know if it was because I was a woman. I just didn't know. And kind of with my ex fiance and this experiences with these men, I started to have a negative picture of Islam. And I started to think, well, this is maybe this is how Muslims really are, and um, I kind it kind of just left a vacuum in me. I wanted this spirituality, but Islam was gone, so I had to find something else. So, and what happened was um, I was at university in my second year, and uh, I had quite a lot of Christian friends, and you know, mashallah, they were such a rock to me during the time after I broke up with my fiance because I was in, I was such a wreck and even even though I was getting treatment for it like 
just the emotional trauma of everything was so great and they kind of comforted me in a way and they taught me a bit more about Christianity and they said, you know, just give it a chance. And I thought, okay, well, I might as well give Christianity a proper chance. And I did for about half a year, I would say, I was practicing Christianity. I was reading as much as I could. I started going to church, um, just doing whatever I could. And I just found like, it didn't help that emptiness. It wasn't helping kind of to heal me in a way. In fact, as the months went on after this breakup, I was getting worse and worse. There were times when I just wasn't leaving the house. I was just so mentally sick and scarred that I I just couldn't face the world and I just wasn't getting any comfort from Christianity and I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, I, I thought it was my fault, you know, that I wasn't getting that comfort. But it kind of took me until kind of the end of the summer and I realised why it wasn't working for me and it was because I knew in my heart I didn't believe what the, my Christian friends believed necessarily. Um, I think like even at an older age, I started reading the Bible again when I was 18. Even then, I was still having the same issues. I was questioning myself, is Jesus really the Son of God? You know, is, is it true or was he just a man? Because, you know, part of me was fearful about it because I knew from knowing about Islam, I knew that the one of the greatest sin that you can commit is shirk and believing in a God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, I was scared of that. I didn't want to make that mistake and I just wasn't certain. And I would read the Gospels and um, from what Jesus salam, said, like there were implicit things that could suggest that he was the son of God, but they were not explicit enough for me. I felt, you know, this is to do with salvation. God has to be explicit, otherwise it just wouldn't be fair. And then pretty much after I'd read the Gospels and I moved on to Acts and the the letters of Paul, I felt there was kind of a shift almost because I, up until this point, I didn't really know much about the Apostle Paul. But this shift, it was saying that more explicitly who Jesus was. And I don't know, I part of me wanted to believe it, but at the same time, I, I just felt like I couldn't in a way. And it was difficult and, I would go and I'd, I'd talk to like my friends and talk to my um, my priest as well and just say, you know, I'm still struggling with this concept of the Trinity and like they did, they spent many hours talking to me about like about it and trying to explain it to me. They were using things like the egg thing and God knows what else and um, it just, it didn't sink in, it just didn't go. And I think the way I practiced as a Christian, I very much practiced as a monotheistic, you know, like I just, I just kind of depended on God and I just saw Jesus as like an inspiration of how to live, how to treat people in a way more than seeing him as this godlike figure. It was strange because I began to miss Islam towards the end of that summer. I miss, I, um, the one day I had a dream and um, I, was, um, I was in this masjid that I'd visited when I was in Egypt and I'd gone to it myself because my fiance had, was busy doing something else and I'd gone for macro prayers and I was just sitting there waiting for the adhan and like, when I woke up from that dream, like I just felt such a sense of loss, like I just missed it so much and I felt like I wanted to pray again. I, I missed learning Arabic, I missed fasting 
You know, the things that I would complain about sometimes, all of a sudden I was starting to miss. But even then I didn't go straight back to Islam. I was looking into other religions. I actually looked more into Catholicism because at the time I was, I was a Protestant um, Church of England. Um, so I looked into Catholicism. I was very interested in their doctrines on um, Mary, um, the mother of Jesus, Salaam, and um, I did quite a lot of research into that, and I, I just didn't find the evidence enough convincing enough for me. And um, the issue with the papacy as well, again, it just wasn't sufficient evidence enough for me to believe it. Um, so I looked into other religions. I was looking into I looked into Ju Judaism, which. Um, impressed me but um, the thing that kind of put me off was the fact that they don't accept converts and I just thought well you know if this faith doesn't accept converts it's that's not a very good show on God really because surely God would want everyone to be saved not just one group of people it just doesn't make sense so I looked into eastern religions as well and for a time I was quite interested in Hinduism and I did so much reading about it and but the only thing is I would read so many books and I would sit there and think have I actually learned anything and the answer would be no because it was just so complicated and so varied I just couldn't get my head around it and I was just like you know I just can't do this and um, I was just thinking well what do I do now there's nothing else that's appealing to me and by this time those feelings of missing Islam were getting stronger and stronger and um, I decided well you know when I first learnt about Islam um, I did it to impress my fiance. And by this time, I was 20, I'd grown up a lot, and I decided, you know what, I should do, I should research Islam fairly and do it with the intention of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So I decided um, this one night, I prayed to Raqqa and I made dua and I said, just, Ya Allah, just, please help me to have clarity in Islam. Please give me this wisdom to understand your faith and show me if this is the right way for me. So I started reading the Quran again. I started, um, the way I got most of my knowledge would be from books and then I'd sit on YouTube and I'd watch so many lectures, hours and hours of lectures. And um, at this time, I was still Sunni because Back from the time when I was with my fiance, I met a few other Muslims. They were friends of his, and um, I'd mentioned um, Shia Islam to them, and their response was, "Don't learn about the Shias. They're disgusting. They're kafir. You know, they they do this, they do that. You know, they put me off." So I wasn't even considering it. But this one day, kind of, and I see it as a miracle now, I um, just sitting on YouTube watching lectures, I came across this one lecture and from the start I noticed it was quite different from other lectures I'd been watching because, you know, people were shouting salawat and at the time I didn't know what salawat was and why they were doing it. And I quickly realised that actually this was a Shia lecture that I was watching. And part of me was just like, maybe I shouldn't be watching this. Maybe I should just switch it off. But out of kind of sheer curiosity, I decided to give it a chance and I just sat and watched it. And the speaker was Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshawani. And... Um, the video I was watching was discussing um, the sheer view on the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Ali. Um, and I was expecting, a ho I don't know what I was expecting, I was just expecting it to be a joke really and a just massive insult. But just the way he spoke was with such eloquence and dignity and honour as well. I liked the fact that he was doing academic discussion, but he wasn't c 
cursing anyone. He wasn't, you know, calling the wives in any kind of derogatory names. It was all very respectful and I appreciated that. And I just couldn't help but just like listen to these arguments and think they actually make sense. I can see where he's coming from. So, but kind of part of me didn't want to believe it because again, it was this fear. I'd been taught that the Sahaba and the wives of the prophets, you know, you cannot criticize them at all. Like any slight criticism, that means that you're a disbeliever in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, even though I did believe it, I didn't really want to. And by the end of this lecture, um, just like, I found it so bizarre, like when um, they were talking about Imam Hussein alayhi salam and, and everyone had started crying and I was sitting there thinking, why are they all crying? I don't understand. This is really strange. I, I didn't understand how they could sit there and cry about a man who lived over, you know, 1400 years ago. It, it was very, very strange, but it was simply because of those arguments that Amanak Shawani made, I decided, well, maybe I should watch a few more of his lectures, and I did, alhamdulillah. And I learned so much. All these misconceptions I had about Shia Islam, they just disappeared. There was a reason why the Shias do what they do. They do it because of the Quran and they do it because of the Sunnah. And um, following on from that, I learned about the Ahlubayt, alayhi salam, and uh, I watched the biographies of each member. And I just really did feel a love and I felt a renewed sense of love for the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then his family as well. And it was just so incredible and so moving to know these people in such an intricate way. And it made sense to me that the Prophet would not leave his ummah without a leader because this was the same man who would cry at night for his ummah. He was, te he was scared for his ummah. He was scared that people were gonna go astray. So why would he and why would Allah himself leave these Muslims alone without a leader? And when I learned about Ghadir and just knowing about the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam, it is, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Imam Ali from the very beginning to be the successor of Prophet Muhammad. And um, I think just a real turning point for me was just learning what happened after the prophet died i realized that i've been lied to about certain things so i realized that you know i'd been to friday prayers before and um they the the imam he was just like saying oh you have to hold on to quran and sunnah and um when I learned it was actually Quran and Ahl al-Bayt, I had a copy of Sahih Muslim in my room and I rushed over to go and get it and I checked and I could see it with my own eyes and I just thought, my God, I, I can't believe I've been lied to about this. And then kind of even more severely, when I learned about the story of Father Mazar, you know, I've been told by Sunnis that Fatima had died of grief when her father had died. And when I found out what really happened to Fatima, it broke my heart and I felt completely disgusted with myself that I'd been lied to and that I allowed people to lie to me. And it, it just, it broke my heart in so many ways and I think just, I think what resonated me with the story of the attack on Fatima's house was, you know, when, when her ribs were broken, I just imagined the agony that she would have gone through. You know, I'm a horse rider myself and there's loads of times that I have fallen off a horse and I've, and I've had a bad fall and I've just lay there on the ground and just thought, what if all my bones are shattered under my body protector? What am I gonna do? Or what if my elbow's broken? You know, in this day and age, I could just go to A&E, but Fatima didn't even have that. And 
just the suffering that she had to go through, the, the beloved daughter of the Prophet, it, it really disgusted me that people were covering that up. And I think after that, the, um, the story of Imam Hussein salam, touched me as well because, you know, Sunnis, they just brush over Karbala, they say it's not important. But when I realized that Imam Hussein was attacked and killed by fellow Muslims, it really kind of shook me in a way. I could see that Karbala was doing like a divide between Islam and what wasn't Islam. And when I knew what Imam Hussein salam, was fighting against, I just thought, you know, I have to, I have to accept Ahlul Bayt salam. Of course I do. I, I can't turn away and say that I'm not on Imam Hussein salam's side. Because if I do that, I would feel like that I would be betraying him. I feel like I'd be betraying my prophet. And I would almost feel like I was on Yazid's side in a way. So um, the time I decided that I was definitely going to follow the path of Ahlul Bayt was actually during last Muharram. Um, I don't know, I, I just got to a point where I was watching so many lectures and um, I got to a point now, I was watching these lectures and it was just touching me so much that I was getting emotional as well. Like, I would be crying at these lectures and they would affect me so much that I would just think about them all day. Um, I think, like, during Muharram, I um, focus quite a lot on looking at the character of um, Zainab alayhi salam. And, um, when I learned of her story, I sobbed for about an hour after finishing that lecture because of what she had gone through. I couldn't believe that one human being could face so much, you know, losing your family like that. I just couldn't imagine it. But the thing that really inspired me, because at this time I was still really suffering with my mental health. I, you know, I was back and forth to the doctors all the time. They get changing my pre um, pr prescription all the time. I was on various different pills and they were, some of them were having really bad side effects on me and it was just a really exhausting process. But the thing that struck me about Zainab salam was the fact that even on the 11th night of Muharram, she was praying Salat al-Layl, you know, not even a, an obligatory prayer, but she still did it and she never complained about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during all that time. And it did make me realize that, you know, the evils that had been done to me in my life, that was not Allah, that was mankind. That if anyone is to blame for the things that have happened to me, it was not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has always been there. He's always been on my side and he's always wanted me to find Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Um, so after that, I decided, yeah, I've, I've got to be a Shia. And I decided as well, you know, I'm gonna adopt an Islamic name and I'm gonna adopt the name Zainab as well. Not just because of the emotional connection, but the thought as well, and the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could use me to be to the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, the hope that I could be as Zainab was to Hussein alayhi salam, I could be like that to Imam Mahdi, inshallah. Um, so with that process, I decided um, I wanted to find a masjid. I wanted to find other sisters. And I started um, looking around and it was a real struggle at first because I felt so limited um, because now I was just looking for a Shia mosque. I wasn't comfortable with going to a Sunni mosque. Um, but anyway, I found a few and I emailed them because I was too afraid to kind of just turn up. I, I emailed them, I explained my situation. I said, I want to take the Shahada please can you help me and um, one masjid out of all the masjids that I contacted only one got back to me 
and that was um, the Masjid Al Hussein in Leicester. And um, you know, mashallah, they were just so kind. I got an email back from the secretary, and then this secretary put me in touch with one of the sisters there, and um, I arranged. We arranged everything. Um, I went to the masjid, and um, I got to meet the Mulana there and a couple of the sisters, and. It was just such a beautiful experience. Like, they were so happy to see me there. They were so respectful and so kind to me. They were just so happy that I was there and that I was considering Islam. And it was just such a remarkable experience. And it just, I walked away from it just feeling so elated and so thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he had provided me for this and you know alhamdulillah I've been able to go to that masjid a few times now and um, like the sisters have just been incredible I've not had one negative um, kind of situation with any of the sisters there young and old they're just so kind and so generous and they're just so happy that I'm their sister and they will do anything for me like they'll give me books so they, they gave me like some prayer clothes it was just I just wasn't used to it just going to Sunni mosques and then coming to this Shia mosque it, the difference was just incredible and I'm just so thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I just hope that he will continue to bless this master because it really is a blessing to us.